Peter Ripper. Thanks to everybody for coming. Uh, this originally was, a, of course, our public broadcast to the senior college. It was uh, six weeks long. And uh, every time I boil it down to an hour, it's sort of like sitting on a suitcase to zip it. <laughs> what am I going to uh, use and what am I going to not use? Uh, but the title, Laughing Matters, are the final words, uh, because that's what sitcoms are, they're laughing matters, but I think laughing matters. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and uh, of course, if it's a sitcom, that's its goal. So let's get started. Oh. Anybody want to guess what this is? The Enigma. The Enigma, that's a very good guess, but it isn't it. <laughs> uh, this, this, this will help you uh, figure it out. And now, this is Charlie Douglas's lock box. <laughs> I think a unique, a unique genre on television. Else. And you can see, when you look at the, this is 2002, there's a, a later one uh, from just a few years ago, but I didn't turn out any graphic yet. Uh, you can see how they dominate. When, when TV died, or anybody ranks great TV shows of all time, they, they're, they're, the half of them are sitcoms. And this is interesting because when you look at movies, 
and they rank the greatest movies of all time. There's 50, and I don't know about you, but I didn't think one flew over the Cougar's Nest was a company. Uh, but they're very few. You know, if, as Ron Dangerfield would say, they, you know, comics don't get no respect. Uh, and I, I, so that's a subject for research as, as to why it is that, that uh, I think, well, it just shows you the sitcom is really a special place in, in, a, in, in our culture uh, as part of TV. Now, sitcoms started under 80. They, they you know, obviously predated television. As you can see, I think you probably recognize most of these people. Uh, I think that's, that's uh, I think Eve Arden, Eve Arden, Arden was that? Yeah, that's that right. <clears throat> and the big hit, huge hit, were these two guys. Anybody know who they are? Amos Sandy. Amos Sandy, when it was called Sam and Henry when it started in 1926. And then they, they were so popular in Chicago, which were, it was there, they wanted to move to another station. and the, the station where they were said, well, you can't take it as Sam and Henry. You'll have to change it and change things in India. <clears throat> Radio was just getting off the ground. And this shows you how popular they were if you look at the, at the ratings there. They, they're far ahead of any other show. But this is what really fascinated me when I, I found this out. See the little arrow there? Amos and Andy is a radio show. It was a nightly radio show. It was so popular that movie theaters quite often would schedule between the screens of movies a broadcast into the theater of the Amos and Andy radio show so people wouldn't stay home. Department stores did the same thing. They would broadcast Amos and Andy in the store. Uh, TV started, actually, I mean, it was available before World War I or World War II, excuse me, uh, you know, they, they started to sell consumer TVs. The first commercial, I, I found this kind of funny. See out here? It's, it's for Bowl of a Watch. This was before a uh, TV broadcast in 1941 uh, on the Dodgers baseball game. Before the game came on, they showed that test pattern, and they, Bowl of, I think, paid 10 bucks to put their name on it, so that, that this is the first commercial in TV history in America. After the war, because television production was halted during the war, after the war, you can see how quickly uh, television became part of uh, their life. Uh, from less than 1% in 1948, over uh, or nearly 90% in 1960. And today, uh, there are more, well, this is just TV sets. But if you add down uh, computer screens and stuff, there are far more screens in everybody's house than there are people. <laughs> and this shows you, I found this fascinating, is how quickly, you know, and I don't think this is just America, obviously, but how quickly we, we, we will adapt a new form of technology if it improves communication, if it improves entertainment, information. Uh, you can see how rapidly radio and TV were, ado were adopted in uh, VCRs. Uh, cable now as quickly because you had to pay for it. Uh, you know, it's, it's nice that you can buy something once and then you don't have to pay for it anymore. <coughs> but you know what they say about TV? Somebody said, as long as there's a jingle in your head, TV isn't free. <laughs> yeah. So this brings us up to you know, the really recent dots for Trooper, the Goldbergs, uh, 49 to 56. Uh, and this woman, uh, somebody described as Oprah before there was Oprah. She had a radio show, she had a TV show, she had a column. She was, at one time, the second most well-known woman in America uh, behind Eleanor Roosevelt. She, she was huge, but she really physically too. So let's watch this bravura, 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 how you say it. Uh, performance of her in one of her shows. Just this blew me away when I saw it the first time. Excuse me, will you please?
please. I'm, I'm, I'm just so besides myself, I can't tell you. We just received a letter from relations we didn't hear from since, since before the war. Oh, it was so pictures and a letter. And, and they're asking us to send them also pictures. Can you imagine that? We'll be all so besides ourselves. I don't know. Pictures have such a way of stirring up of, of the memory. And I'm, I'm reminded again and again that my father was such a smart man. If not, we would be where our cousins are and, 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 and vice versa. And what do you think? The, the pilgrims' fathers weren't smart also. They also knew that across the ocean that there was a new nation bursting forth. And it took, it took generations to have what we had, but we had it. And we shouldn't take it, you know, just, uh, just for granted. But whatever is good, we haven't got it. J just name it and we have it. From, uh, from what shall I say, from, from Sanka to... Yes, Sanka coffee. Yes, indeed. Yes, indeed. Don't forget, you know, that's, a, that's an American necessity. You know, we are the powerhouse of the world. And American people, you know, are the little dynamos. That's why, you know, not every American can drink coffee with caffeine in it. Not at all. That's why Sanka was born. What do you mean? 97% of the caffeine is out and the sleep is left in. And you can drink as much as you like and sleep. And it don't disturb your disposition. And it's delicious. And the flavor is memorable. Absolutely memorable. And for the American temple, Instant Sanka fits like a glove. One, two, three, with a little boiling water, the delicious, delicious cup of Sanka. And then, I, you know, I, I, I never get over wondering her, the wonderment of Americans in America and, and the wonderful inventions. I'm going to write a letter. You, 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 you'll give a letter. Excuse me. I remember that man when he was littler than Pinky. <laughs> <laughs> this is the first letter and the first picture that we have from them since the war. A beautiful letter, huh, Jack, dear? You know, it wasn't beautiful. <laughs> Just hearing from your relatives in Europe after not hearing for so many years. Okay. Philip Lowe, the husband, uh, some of you may know what the story of about the television, but television, right from the beginning, couldn't divorce itself from reality, from what was going on in the country. Philip Lowe, was put on the blacklist by McCarthy. Uh, he was a communist. He, he was very involved in labor uh, issues. And, and uh, the sponsor of the, uh, of the Goldbergs at that time, uh, General Foods, and they told, they told Bertrand Bird, you've got to get him off the shelf. You've got to get rid of a fellow club. She refused at first, but uh, she, she sought help. She actually went to, uh, I can't remember the name, it was Cardinal Spelman, mm -hmm. it was a famous cardinal mm -hmm. in New York, and asked for his help. And he said, I'd help you if you convert uh, to Catholicism. But <laughs> <laughs> she re refused to do. But anyhow, he eventually uh, was, was off the show, and he couldn't get work. And through his, uh, he uh, overdosed of a uh, single dose and uh, commit suicide. Uh, how many have seen the movie The Front? Woody Allen plays in it. It was written by a blacklisted writer, directed by a blacklisted director. Zero Mostel plays the character uh, based on Philip Lowe, who throws himself out the window when he's blacklisted and can't get work anymore. And Lowe was sort of the uh, Mostel Doing a, a tribute to his friend Phil Cole. TV was really lucky, very early on, and two of the best shows ever, right near the beginning of, uh, of television in America. And uh, the, the Goldbergs, and these two shows also sort of mark the end of the early period of. Uh, of sitcoms in America because Goldberg's living in a tenement, Cardo's living in an apartment, Colbert the flat, uh, Goldberg's living in immigrants. You know, TV sitcoms were going to move into the suburbs from Cardo's and I know Lucy in its last season actually they did live in, in, in the house of the suburbs. So these shows sort of, you know, uh, were, were reflected at that time uh, of, of what, what uh, 
was really true for many people in America that uh, hadn't left the, the city yet. But there's such a rush to go to the suburbs after the war uh, that sitcoms are going to change and reflect that. I Love Lucy was the first show uh, to be the number one show for five straight years. Uh, it, was a, it was a huge hit. And why would it be? Uh, Lucy Ball was a fat, fabulous comedian. But it's interesting, it almost didn't get made because she had a successful radio show called My Favorite Husband, and CBS wanted to move it to television. But Lucy said, well, the guy who plays my husband on the radio, I don't want to take him. I want my husband to be my husband on television. That's the right answer. She just said, well, who's going to believe an all-American girl like you who's married to a human family? And she said, but I am married to a human And she got her way. Then it became the, the just gigantic hit. But again, I thought, I didn't know this until I started digging into this. Uh, Lucy was uh, almost outed as a communist. What had happened was, when she was young, uh, her grandfather was a communist, and he got her to register on a voter's registration, she was, and it was discovered uh, how some American, uh, what's it called, House of American Activities Committee, uh, interviewed her privately. It wasn't known to the public. Uh, she, she said, Grandpa made me do it. And they gave her a pass. But I think they also probably gave her a pass because she was too big a fish. <laughs> she had the number one show on TV. And she was like beloved, you know, the big star. And Desi, when, when this broke, uh, he came out, you know, they, I'll get into this, about how they, they did the show live before an audience. And he came out and said, the only thing you read about Lucy is her hair, and that's not what you <laughs> oh, yeah? <laughs> Atta girl, Lucy. I was wondering what happened to you. It just sunk in. I don't know how you treat your women in Cuba, but this is the United States, and I have my right. I am not arguing about women's rights. I am the first one to agree that women should have all the rights they want as long as they stay in their place. <laughs> oh, you're just as bad as he is, Fred. You men tell us that we have equal rights, but you certainly don't give us a chance to act like it. What do you want? You've got the vote? You wear pants? <laughs> you drive buses? You rustle? You go every place you please except the steam room and the YMCA. <laughs> that isn't true. Equal rights means just what it says, equal rights. Well, that's a good explanation. Oh, you know what she means. Yes, and we want to be treated that way. From now on, everything is equal. We want to be treated exactly as if we were men. I don't know if Lucy will ever go down as a great feminist, but, you know, almost every plot of Lila Lucy was the same. It was her trying to get out from under being just a housewife. She wanted to be on the show. She wanted to get, you know, the famous scene with the candy. She wanted to go get a job. She always had these harebrained schemes and ideas that didn't work out. But underlying all that was her sort of dissatisfaction with the role she was playing at home. This is Desi's, Desi's wife who stopped in the kitchen. Uh, another thing about the show you about it's Fred and Nate, Ethel, the two actors hated each other. Uh, and the story goes that when Fred, Fred, Fred was an alcoholic, Desi was an alcoholic, they, uh, it wasn't good for either of them. But uh, anyhow, so, so uh, William Frawley dies, and uh, Ethel, what's that, Ethel Stank? I forgot. Vivian Vance. Vivian Vance. Right, is in the restaurant when she 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 finds out. The story goes, she found out. She said, drinks for everybody, on me. Thing about I Love Lucy that's also really important in the history of television, television sitcoms is Desi Arnaz's uh, G 
Can you speak up, please? Sure. That's your that's genius. Uh, he knew that Lucy performed best when she appeared in front of a live audience. Uh, sitcoms, up, a, up until then, mostly were shot with a single camera, with no audience. Uh, and Desi wanted to figure out a way that they could shoot Lucy with an audience, but that they wouldn't be holding people hostage with a single camera that they had to move around to shoot all the various scenes. <coughs> There were a couple of problems. How do you get all the sets that are going to be in the show in one place? Well, you can see this in a model. There's the nightclub. There's the kitchen. There's the living room. There's the bedroom. They had cameras that they could move. You know, they could see here three cameras. The problem was how are you going to light it so you don't have to move lights around? So you got one of the best lighting directors from the movies figured out a way to do it. If you watch the show, you realize the lighting is very flat, because all they're trying to do is avoid shadows, so that they can move those cameras around, and just keep the thing going while they hold a live audience there to watch this. And that was part of the key to uh, the success of the show, was giving Lucy the audience she needed uh, to, be able to uh, be able to do the show in a really quick fashion. But there are a couple of other things she did that were also genius. Lucy, most of the sitcoms at this time were being done in Europe. Lucy wanted to do theirs in Los Angeles because their marriage was, it was shaky from the get-go. And she thought if they lived in Los Angeles, she could save it. So they did the show in, in Los Angeles, but they did it on 35 millimeter film, like the movies. <coughs> most sitcoms, like the Goldbergs, we saw the clip, when they were recorded, they were recorded by having placing a TV camera in front of a monitor and shooting off the screen. It's a and you can see it's very grainy, uh, not in focus, blurry. And this is pristine. And guess what? He inadvertently invented reruns. Because one, one day, CBS, a show wasn't available. And they thought, what are we going to do a show? Well, they had these beautiful 35 millimeter uh, prints of Isla Lucy. They showed Isla Lucy. And the other thing that the, the Arnazes, Lucy, and Desi had done was they wanted to own their show. So when they signed their original contract, they took less pay so that they could have the rights to their show. And as they say, uh, the sun set, never set, so the British Empire and I love Lucy. It was, it was bought and, and seen around the world, it still is to this day. <clears throat> Jackie Lisa, Jackie Lisa and Lucy had something in common. They both had miserable childhoods. Lucy was shuffled around when her father died, uh, when she, I think she was three, and her first memory was the day her father died. Uh, and Jackie Lisa, his father left the home when he was nine. His mother died when he was 19. He had no home and no anything. He had nothing when he was 19 years old. So he became a hood. Uh, and then he became who he is. Uh, the Honeymooners really started as a sketch on his variety show in the early 50s. And it was so successful as a sketch that uh, it was General Motors that bought or did a contract with him to do 78 episodes for CBS. Um, he did the first 39, and he had like $7 million left that he was to receive, and said, I'm not doing it. I think we've run out of material. So that's why, you know, when you, when you, you can purchase the episodes, you know, it's, you know, a lot of shows have 200 episodes, and only, and only 39 of mm -hmm. the really great episodes were all done in the year. <laughs> he also had, I think, the best ensemble cast in the history of sitcoms with Art Carney and Audrey Meadows. So let's watch them in action. You don't have to look, pal. All right. You just play them, and I'll name them. All right. Come on! This is my last night to brush 
up on the songs. Now let's not waste any time. Get going. All right. I told you once, I told you a hundred times. It's the only way I can warm up before I play the piano. A pitcher warms up before he pitches a ball game? I gotta warm up that way before I play the piano. I hope I don't have to tell you this again. Are you ready? Go ahead and play. Second Street, the year was 1932. <laughs> All right, Mr. Cramden, I wish you a lot of luck, and here's your first question for $100. Are you ready? I certainly am. All right, Mr. Cramden, for $100, who is the composer of Swanee River? That's right, Swanee River. Can we have a few bars of Swanee River, Jose? <laughs> That's Swanee River? That's right. Now, who's the composer? Your time's running out. Hurry up. You better take a guess. Hum a hum a hum a hum a hum a Ed Norton? <laughs> Sorry, Mr. Cranston. No, the correct answer is Stephen Foster. But thanks so much. You've been a wonderful contestant and a swell sport. Goodbye, Mr. Cranston. Another difference between Lucy Ball and Jackie Grease is Lucy Ball rehearsed meticulously. She, she just had to nail everything she was a perfectionist. He didn't rehearse at all. He winged it, which is quite amazing. There's sort of a dark side yeah. uh, also. <laughs> you know, Ralph would, or to, to hundreds, Ralph would threaten Alice. Right? Something that was somehow acceptable on television when that show was on. It wouldn't be today, or would it? You're a darling, you're an angel, and I love you. But you always give me steam somehow. Well, you're not the greatest lover, but you sure can drive a bus. You just gotta stop before I blow my top. But one of these days, one of these days, pow! right in the pit, sir. One of these days, one of these days, pow! That's a promo. It still runs. <laughs> Kind of amazing to me. But of course, it always ended up with uh, Alice forgiving Ralph, maybe you're the greatest. Uh, and it's sort of interesting to me, it's the opposite of the relationship of the Ricardos, where it was Lucy that did the, the, the harebrained scheme, and then Desi would sort of shrug and say, you know, forgive her. In this case, Alice was really the boss. Ralph was always doing something really stupid. And, now we get to, this is the period that most, I think, interested me, perhaps, <coughs> me when I was growing up, happy days, the, the nuclear, perfect families of the, the 50s and the, the early 60s. I think you can, can you identify all of them there? Yeah. Everybody yeah. know all of them? So, yeah. Yeah. they left their mark. Um, and here's why I think they were so important. On the one hand, they all had this morality uh, play sort of attached to them. There's always, you know, this is how you're supposed to behave. You know, they, 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 somebody would do something stupid, you know, or uh, you know, get in trouble, and the, the, the family would deal with it, and everything would work out fine. But right and wrong was clearly defined. Let's, I, got th I just found three examples to, to make this point, show you what I'm talking about here. 
Is that you, Beaver? Yes, Mom. Oh, Beaver, I see you're home. Yes, Dad. This is me that's home. <laughs> How was the movie? Well, I didn't go to the movie. You didn't go to the movie? No, sir. I went yesterday when I wasn't supposed to. Oh, is that so? Yes, sir. And I went a racing bicycle with a guaranteed leather seat. And I hit it at Larry's. And I was going to make believe like I wanted today. But I couldn't. So that's why I'm telling you what happened. Well, uh, when did you decide to tell us about it? When I was walking the bike home from Larry's. <laughs> yeah, Dad. It's too big for him to ride. Really? Well, Beaver, I'm glad you decided to tell us the truth. Of course, you realize you can't keep a bicycle you won while you were being disobedient. We'll have to find something to do with the bike. Larry and I already found something to do with it. Oh, you did? Yeah. I walked it back to Larry's house, and then Larry and I walked it down to a church. To a church? Yes, sir. Larry wants something to do with babies in a movie. Do what? We left it on the front steps with a note. I just hope someone nice adopts it. Well, Beaver, I, I'm also very glad you realized you couldn't keep the bicycle. But there's still the matter of your being disobedient, isn't there? Yes, sir. Well, I think you'd better stay away from the movies for um, two weeks. Yes, sir. Hey, that was really something what he did, wasn't it, huh? It certainly was. You know, for a little kid like that, a lot of stuff sure goes on in his head. Mom and Dad, I'm real sorry for all the trouble I caused. And Dad, thanks for putting the money up for me. Well, it's a cheap price to pay, Jeff, if you've learned one important lesson. When you take on a responsibility, be conscientious about it. That's a lesson I'll never forget. And next time, I mean, don't wait so long to come to us. That's what we're for, honey, to help carry the load. Mm, you don't know what a heavy load $37 can be until you don't have it to carry. <laughs> Club, pull up a chair. Oh, um, get this one for mommy. There's nothing like hamburgers for Thanksgiving. Oh, I'm starving. So am I. You know something? This is the happiest, unhappy Thanksgiving I've ever spent. <laughs> well, I feel I'd like to say thanks in a rather special way. Oh, Lord, we give thee thanks from the depths of our humble hearts for all the blessings thou hast seen fit to bestow upon us. We thank thee for the food which graces our table, the roof which covers our head, we thank thee for the privilege of living as free men in a country which respects our freedom and our personal rights to worship and think and speak as we choose. We thank thee for making us a family, for giving us sincerity and understanding. But most of all, dear Lord, we thank thee for giving us the greatest gift a family may know, the gift of love for one another. at the time. <laughs> it, might, it might today, but the country was so united. What after happened World to War the II. turkey? Huh? Where was the turkey? <laughs> there was no turkey. I just put, you know, the first one they had in the state, you know, you know, we punishment. Know. Second one they had, uh, what did they have for the second one there? Uh, I, I'm just trying to make a, a point. There was no turkey. Oh, why didn't they have a yes. turkey? Oh, things just got all messed up. They didn't know they were going to have But they healed their problem. But, uh, but this, this was lessons being taught to, to all of us kids and even the adults who watched the shows. Uh, this is how you're supposed to be. And this was the show I loved the most. And <clears throat> oh, about 10 years ago, I found like 50 episodes in the Best Buy and I bought them. Mm. And I started to watch them again. And I thought, they're a name. They're, they're terrible. And I still love them. 
know, and, and, and the reason I'm here today is that was what sparked me to try to figure out why was it. And it came down to a pretty simple answer, I think. I just wanted to be part of a perfect family. My family wasn't so bad, but we were far from perfect. And this was a perfect family. Now, the other thing going on was advertisers discovered TV was the best thing ever invented for selling stuff. And look what happened from 48, 12 million to 55, 1 billion spent on advertising on television. And uh, I don't know about you, I love old commercials, so let's look at a couple. Milk? Butter? Fruit? Gosh, how my guys do love to eat. Sometimes I wonder where they put it all. Especially David and Ricky. They're banging in and out of our refrigerator all day long. I don't mind, though. It keeps them happy. I'm sure our hot point refrigerator doesn't mind, either. I've never seen anything so strong and well-built. Everything about it looks like it will just last and last. I have a feeling it'll be with us long after David and Ricky are grown up and married. And I love the way our hot point's designed, too. It could have been made for me. All the interior arrangements are so practical. Oh, and don't you just love this enormous freezer? You'd be surprised how many trips to the store this saves the boys and me. Of course, I never have to defrost my hot point. Why don't you talk to your hot point dealer today about a refrigerator like this for your family? No, that was a soft sound. This is a little different. It was a soft sound. Dishes, dishes, dishes. Three times a day, every day of your life. Sometimes does the sight of another stack of dirty dishes make you want to... Then, lady, you need a hot point automatic dishwasher. For here's the appliance that banishes dishwashing drudgery forever. Saves you at least an hour of work every day. More time and work than all other kitchen appliances combined. And this next one sort of sums up everything you needed to get to be a middle class American. Mr. Jones and Mr. Crampler were neighbors. They each had $3,000. With his money, Mr. Jones bought himself a $3,000 car. With his money, Mr. Crampler bought himself a new refrigerator, a new range, a new washer, a new dryer, a record player, two new television sets, and a brand new Volkswagen. <laughs> Now Mr. Jones is faced with that age-old problem, keeping up with the Kremplers. <laughs> After the, the period of these preachy, uh, you know, normalistic sitcoms, there was a period of time, they call it, an actual, there's a, been described as the escapist sitcoms. And as you can see, uh, you know, a genie, a witch, talking horse, uh, even further away from dealing with any controversial issue, uh, certainly not being preaching. But that was, that was to end. Because the 50s, the low of the 60s, had arrived, and as you can see, things changed in society. And television was going to about to change along with it. Norman Lear, we all know what show he created. And he sort of summed it up that the, you know, the escapist comedies were fine, but you know, the problems they dealt with were not at all significant. <laughs> all the film was actually based on an English, uh, British sitcom called Took That to Give Us Heart. And the, the model, uh, even though there was money in that show, the real model for Archie was Lear's father, who was sort of a bigot, and also uh, found he actually sort of in, uh, in prison. Uh, I worked, my first job out of college, I worked at CBS in New York. And uh, a 
couple months before all the family aired, we got to see uh, a screening of the show. And I think everybody was so stunned because we'd never seen anything quite like this show on television. <clears throat> Just an example of the kind of dialogue that I mean, can't imagine that this would have ever uh, been in the 50s for sure. It was actually really sad to see the show was not there. Um, we'll show, a, <laughs> we'll show a, a, a clip that maybe you've seen. This is, <laughs> Get me a beer, huh? And eat, eat it in a glass this time, huh? And I open up a fresh box of Twinkies for Mr. Davis. <laughs> Twinkies? <laughs> yeah, it's kind of a wasp soul food. <laughs> The doctor, uh, listen to him, uh, he's a kind of a meathead, Mr. Davis. Well, why don't you stop calling me Mr. Davis and just call me Sam? Oh, hey, I, I'd like to do that. Okay. Sam? Yeah, that's nice. Uh, and then you can call me Archie. I mean, what the hell? <laughs> uh, Sam, uh, uh, where are you flying out to tonight? Uh, Las Vegas, maybe? No, I have a TV special to do in Hollywood. Oh, gee, that's beautiful. Yeah. yeah. Well, uh, uh, you know, while you're hanging around, you give us maybe a little preview, one of the, one of the songs you're going to do? Daddy! <laughs> Mr. Davis makes his living entertaining. You're asking him to go to work. Yeah, Arch, how would you like to be a guest in somebody's house? And he said, come on, Arch, do some packing and lifting for us. <laughs> WJM 6 o'clock news. Oh, Mr. Grant. Oh, well, that's just not... I, 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 I just don't know what to say. Really? I thought you put it very well. <laughs> but I mean, it's just so incredible. I mean, because, you know, of course, I always dreamed that one day I would be a producer, but that you would actually, at this point, you know, make me your co-producer. No, 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 not co-producer. I'm making you the producer. Well, what about you? I'm making myself executive producer. <laughs> That's great. But what made you suddenly decide to 
wanted to make me the producer. Well, I just thought our promotion was long overdue. Oh, thank you, Mr. Grant. Not yours, mine. <laughs> <laughs> so, then, you'll be the executive producer and I'll be the producer. <laughs> what do we do about offices? What do you mean? Where will my office be? What do you mean an office for? Well, I just assumed that as producer, I have a lot more responsibilities, you know, a lot more things to do. No, no, no. Whatever you used to do as associate producer, you'll do now as producer. <laughs> Naturally, there will be certain financial benefits. Oh? Starting next month, you're going to get a raise of $1,000 a year. Oh, that's great! <laughs> Uh, Mr. Grant, that's uh, what, uh, $20 a week, isn't it? I, I thought I was going to get a raise of $20 a week anyway. <laughs> well, now you're going to get it for sure. <laughs> well, thank you. Mr. Grant, let me just see if I'm getting this straight. <laughs> I'm going to be the producer, but I'm going to have the same responsibilities, the same job, uh, the same office, and uh, I'll be doing the very same things I have been doing. Right. Well, well, well. I just hope I can handle it. <laughs> you know, Archie was the worky stiff who could never get a break. Mary was striving to, she didn't break the glass here, but she cracked it. Uh, but the big difference for me between the two was just the real human nature, which is sort of the split we have in this country today. I where Archie just had a basic distrust of everyone. And there he was the opposite. Uh, there are a lot of, you know, she passed away this, this year. And uh, she was an inspiration for an awful lot of people. Um, and the next guy was an inspiration for an awful lot of people too, but it's sort of a sad story. Um, you know, the computer has time machine where you can go back and, uh, and see what was on your hard disk at any given point in time, and I wish we could do that with Bill Cosby. Uh, but let's forget about the present for the moment, and just remember his show uh, was really groundbreaking. Now, the interesting thing to me about the show was when he, he had had two failed sitcoms after I spot, and he was approached about doing a third, and he had the idea that it would be a black working class couple. He'd be a limo driver on his own. Limo's wife would be an electrician. And NBC actually was going to go along with that. But Cosby's wife objected. She says, well, that's not who we are. You know, we're educated. We're, we're, we're professional people. And that's what your show should be about. So he changed it. To him, Cliff Huxtable being a doctor and Claire Huxtable being a lawyer, although he never really saw them working. But in any, any event, what the message he wanted to get across was there was a black couple who were raising their kids to go to college and succeed in life. And here's a, we taught a lot of lessons of the show about uh, how to do that. <laughs> How do you expect to get into college with grades like this? No problem. Huh? See, I'm not going to college. Damn right. <laughs> I am going to get through high school and then get a job like regular people. Regular people? Yeah, you know, who work in a gas station, travel bus, something like that. <laughs> so what you're saying is you're... Your mother and I shouldn't care if you get D's because you don't need good grades to be regular people. Right. <laughs> Suppose you graduate from high school. Let's say you just slide by. All right. Now, now you got to find a job. Now, what kind of salary do you expect uh, for a regular person? <laughs> mm, $250 a week. $250 a week? Yeah. Sit down. I'm going to give you $300 a week. Yes, indeed. $300 a week, $1,200 a month. All right? Great, I'll take it. Yes, you will. And I will take 
$350 for taxes. Whoa! Huh? Yeah, now, now uh, because, see, the government comes for the regular people first. <laughs> Uh, it strikes me that Cosby was sort of like uh, President Obama, because you know, he never rejected race into that show, really. Uh, and the show was uh, received positively by most blacks, but Henry Louis Gates was one who, who didn't like the show. And the reason he did was he thought by making the couple of the family, you know, upper, upper middle class, that it was making a statement that somehow prejudice and, and, and opportunity were no longer problems for black people in America. So, so there was a little bit of a schism. These copper sitcoms uh, you know, sort of disappeared. Uh, maybe a bit of a harbinger of, you know, how class people starting to feel the more uh, became disaffected. But uh, this Roseanne in nineteen ninety seven, I don't know if there really has been a, a really good working class uh, kind of show since But families involved, uh, even back even back whoops, even back in the uh, late fifties when you had the single fathers, then you had the single mothers. Uh, then you had Murphy Brown, where she actually had a, uh, a child out of wedlock. Uh, that was 1988, and it became part of the uh, election campaign in 88. Remember this one, Dan Quayle? Mm -hmm. uh, he took a lot of heat, uh, but I, I think, you know, even though the TV is now, it's fragmented. It wasn't fragmented yet, really. You know, there's still the, the networks were these huge uh, water pumps where all you know, millions and millions of people watch. Now, sitcoms appeal all kinds of niche groups. And so if this happened today on a sitcom, it would probably not cause much of a stir. Uh, but back then, when everybody was drinking from the same hose, you know, there, there was this large group of people in the country who were offended by this. And families, the idea of families evolved too. So you could have a family in a Harvey Field Hospital or uh, retirees in their own in a home or at a bar. Uh, but you know what it was kind of the common in, in a lot of sitcoms? Let's see. More back here. Uh, they had couches. <laughs> <laughs> so much of the action in sitcoms occurs in a living room. Mm -hmm. It's just something, you know, nobody that, that I know has written about, but it just struck me when I'm looking at pictures of sitcoms, everybody sitting on a couch. Mm -hmm. This was the show, as far as I'm concerned, turning things upside down. Fox Network, the first night that they uh, were on the air, this was one of the shows that aired, Married with Children. And it wasn't a, ever a real big rating success because Fox was still acquiring affiliates didn't have uh, the stations that we give them huge numbers, but the show ran for a long, long time, and it just flipped those 50 sitcoms early uh, on its head, totally, totally. And it's more more like, you know, I, I'm comparing, you remember Art Linklater, his shows when we were young, and then Jerry Springer? This was the equivalent of that. Kind of. <coughs> Linklater to Springer from Father Knows Best to, to Father Knows Squaw. <laughs> Kids, I gotta tell you, I love the day after Thanksgiving. We already got that giving thanks crap out of the way, and we get to have leftovers. Peg, is it ready yet? Here it comes! <laughs> last night to only eat the cheese so we'd have the crust for today. Yeah. <laughs> I bet a lot of other stupid families ate their whole pizza last night. <laughs> That's it, they're probably just looking at the old empty cardboard box. <laughs> I can't do it. 
Dad, I think I speak for us all. This really bites the big one. <laughs> Why can't we have turkey like real people? Oh, now, bud. It's not like your father's a doctor or a lawyer or a, a bathroom attendant or a service <laughs> He's just a shoe salesman, doing the best he can. Okay, Peg, I think we get the message here. Obviously, this is the fault of the only one who works around here. That would be, let me see. Mm? 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 Well, gold darn it, it's me. <laughs> well, what the heck, I'll quit. Then we'll be at Eden, won't we? Oh, honey, nobody wants you to quit. We all appreciate what you do for this family. <laughs> This was the grossest show on TV. Does anybody remember the name Terry Ricotta? Terry Ricotta was a housewife in Michigan. And she was so offended by a show where a woman took off her bra, you didn't see it, but you knew that it was happening in front of Al Bundy, that she started a campaign to get the show taken off the air. The show's ratings up to that point hadn't been anything special. But all of a sudden, they got this huge, <laughs> greatest boost. Because everybody wanted to tune in and see what this was all about. And you know, that I actually found there's a term for this that I didn't know. It's called the Streisand effect. Anybody ever heard of hear that? Barbara Streisand built a house in Malibu that uh, she didn't want anybody to see. Well, you know, she didn't want photographers or anybody to show the house. And because of that, you know, they set up helicopters and got shots, and you know, it became something that was seen by millions that, you know, she had just done one photo shoot or something, it would have been seen by many people. Well, the same thing happened with, <coughs> with this show. Uh, it's also the, the, it's in second place now for all kind of words, the longest running show never to win an Emmy. Anybody want to guess which show passed it as the longest show never to win an Emmy? Sitcom? Not, not a sitcom. Sopranos? John Carson? Simpsons? No, no, close. No. They watch. <laughs> <laughs> so there goes the family. Married with the children. You know, as I said, became the prototype of the dysfunctional family, uh, which is prominent, certainly still today. And then he brings us up the side We're almost done. Whoops. Brings us up the side phone. Um, you know, you probably heard this, uh, that it's a show about nothing. Well, you can think about that for a second. If it's a show about nothing, then what the hell is Ozzy and Harriet? I mean, there's an episode of Ozzy and Harriet that I remember where the whole episode was about trying to find a pint of tutti frutti ice cream. Uh, I think that could have been a Seinfeld show, actually. Uh, but Seinfeld really... You know, it hit a nerve. I mean, it's funny. I mean, that's basically, I don't think it's revolutionary. I did deal with the minutia of life. Uh, that's what it, it was obsessed with it. But I don't think it was revolutionary. I think it was just <coughs> funny. But the question I have about Seinfeld is just as the, 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 the nuclear families, the perfect families of the 50s, may not have reflected what was actually going on in the country. I don't think this show did either. I mean, you know, it reflects maybe a group of, uh, of people who live in New York City who are neurotic. Uh, <laughs> but why was it such a sensation? I think pretty much because it's really funny. Let's, let's watch a clip. Of course, it, it is a sort of the opposite of preaching uh, lessons about how to behave, too. <laughs> Listen up. Now, you three have been handpicked out of possibly dozens who applied. Now, what we're looking for are motivated, hardworking, homeless uh, gentlemen like yourselves to pull rickshaws. Now, I don't care where you're from or how you got here or what happened to your homes, but you will have to be physically fit. The government! <laughs> because the pull rickshaws requires more than just strong legs. You're also going to need a well-toned upper body. Or a shirt. Right, who's first? Hey, please, Rusty. Rusty. You know, I once knew a horse named Rusty. No, 
offense. All right, now take it down the end of the block. Make a control turn and bring her back. Let's see what you got. Okay, ready? And go. Get it. The far. All right, pace yourself because you're going to have to do this all day for very little money. Hey, what's he doing? Look at him, he's stealing our rickshaw. And he's out. I'll take the job. Despicable people, really. I don't, I don't know if you feel that way. But, uh, Larry Dane, who created the show with Jerry Seinfeld, went on to create his own, and I'll finish up with this. Uh, anyhow, this is, this is somebody making that point that why, who, who do they represent? You know, who knows how Jerry Seinfeld is related to this in real life? How they portray themselves on TV? Uh, Sort of accurate, I think. And then let's go back and remember we saw Beaver Cleaver get punished for doing something noble. Uh, and here's how an interaction between an adult and kids uh, could be today on TV, we must today on TV on this show. Hi, so lemonade, huh? Yep. Good for you. Good for you, you're entrepreneurs. Hey, mister, did you steal the pants? No, 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 I, I didn't steal them. An alarm went off in the store and I had to leave the store. You mean, don't they want your pants back? I have to bring them back and I'm going to. But I had to steal them. Anyway, I'll buy some lemonade. How much is it? A buck. A buck? Fine. Thank you very much. There you go. Are you kidding me? Oh my God, this is awful. I'm not even joking. Who made that? Us. Us. It's beautiful. You made it? Give me my money back. No, you, know? you can't. I want my dollar money. back. Get, get out of here. Just get out of here. Fine, I'll get out. Bye. It's terrible. You stink. You stink. I'm going to report you guys for that. Go ahead. I'm going to. Charles. Bald asshole. Get out of here. <laughs> Mom. Hey, Charles. Oh, my God. Oh, my God. So I'll leave you with this question. You know, the sitcoms or do sitcoms reflect who we are at any particular time in American history, <clears throat> or sometimes can they also be sort of beacons, you know, sort of a guiding light? Do we are becoming or want to be? Uh, that's sort of the question that I take away from this. And I'll, I'll let um, Mel Brooks have the. I, I know I'm not this guy. I don't think any of you are either. Uh, I'll let Mel Brooks have the, the last word. Humor is just not in the past, I guess, of course. I think we all need to laugh. Uh, and so I hope we got some pleasure out of this talk. Because laughing matters.